Yes, any questions that came to your mind during the break? No questions? Yes. Which one? Well, I mean, I have this E, which I write as E other plus E A, meaning that the E A is the electric field created by the charges in A, and E other is the electric fields created by all the other charges. And what I'm interested in eventually was the, the force acting on this area. But a charge would feel a force due to the electric field created by other charges. This area cannot exert a force on itself. So what I need to evaluate if I want to calculate the force acting on this area is that I need to calculate the electric field created by all the other charges. That is what I'm interested in. So the question is, well, I know that I can measure the total electric field, not just the other electric, the E other. So how can I obtain the electric field created by the other charges knowing the electric field everywhere. And we said that, okay, this E other is continuous across this area, whereas this e, the EA is not continuous across e, this area. So if I just take the average of the electric fields on both sides of this area, since this just changes sign, as you go from one side to the other side, when I take their sum, this cancels, what remains is E other. And that is what I needed. So it's not that I couldn't evaluate E or whatever. The problem was I, wa I need to find this one to calculate the force. That is why I separated them. Other questions? Then I have a question for you. Now, suppose I have a conductor. And let's say that I divide it into two parts. Just mathematically, I imagine it <coughs> consisting of two parts. And let's say that when I put a total charge Q on this conductor, Q over four, goes here and 3q over 4 goes to the other side. <coughs> of course, other side meaning the surface of the other side because since it's a conductor, the, all the charges will be on the surface. On this surface, the total charge is q over 4. On this surface, the total charge will be 3q over 4. Let's just assume. Now, my question is, suppose I add another q charge. I double the charges. How will the charge be distributed? Q over 4 here and 3Q over 4 here. Or let's say, <coughs> since there are more charges over here already, more charge will go to this side if I add another Q. Let's say 3Q over 4 here and Q over 4 here. What will be the distribution of charges? What do you think is more likely? A or B? You say A, you say A, A, B. No, I mean, we put some plus Q charge, let's say five coulomb, four, five, four coulomb, coulomb. I have this conductor, I put four coulombs in. When I put four coulombs, then I measure that the total charge in this surface is one coulomb. The total charge over here is three coulomb. So one goes here, three goes there. Then I add another four coulombs to the same system, which, was, which already carried four coulombs. I just 
make it adding by four more coulombs, the total charge will be eight coulombs. Now this additional four coulombs, will it be also distributed the same way? One coulomb here, three coulomb here? Or since there is already many charges over here, three coulombs, which will be pushing the additional charges I put, there are less charges over here. So more, of, more than one coulomb will go here of this additional four coulomb, and less than three coulomb will go there. That is part B. Or let me write it in this form. Larger than Q over four on this side and less than three Q over four on the other side. So this is the question, A or B. Still A? A. A. B. Throw coins. B. A. Still A. 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 B. B. Okay, so still the A's are a bit long, a bit more. Well, the answer is A. The distribution will not change. <coughs> well, let's see why. Let us say that, okay, this is my system. Let us be a bit more precise. I don't need to have Q over 4 and 3Q over 4 like this. Now, what do we know? We, we know that there is some charge distribution. And so that the total charge will be d cubed r, rho of r. This is equal to, let's say, q. This is rho q. Let me just rewrite this as q times rho tilde of r. Kind of rho tilde gives me the general distribution. Not the total charge, but it tells me where the, the most of the charges are, their relative densities. Now, the claim is that <coughs> this rho tilde is independent of Q. So if I just double it, it's just the charge density at every point doubles. The, the relative distribution does not change. That is the claim. But you see, <coughs> now we know that the, okay, this is a conductor. That's what we will need. We can even have more than one conductor, not necessarily just a single one. We can have more than one. It won't, I mean, it won't really change. So we know that rho phi is equal to zero everywhere except the conductor. Let's say the surface of the conductor. Phi is equal to constant on the surface. Well, basically, the electric field is perpendicular. So if you just take, well, you don't even need that. If you just take any two points on the surface, you can connect them by a line that is entirely inside the conductor. So E dot DL across that line will be zero because the electric field is zero. But it, the integral of E dot DL is nothing but the potential difference between that point and this point. Two points on the surface, it is zero. The potential difference is zero, so the potential is the same everywhere on the surface. And furthermore, if we calculate the surface integral of the normal derivative of phi, well, the normal derivative of phi is nothing but the perpendicular component of the electric field, so this is E dot ds. This is equal to the total charge, minus the total charge, over epsilon zero. Let me call this potential Q. No, okay. 
So given these conditions, we know that the solution is unique. Let me call this phi q, sorry. Meaning that it is the potential created by the charge q. But once we, the solution is unique, once we determine phi, we can determine the electric field, and once we have, we know the electric field everywhere, we can calculate the discontinuity of the electric field on the surface of the conductor, and hence determine the charge distribution on the surface of the conductor. So once we determine phi, we can find the charge distribution everywhere. And we know that there is a unique phi. Now the question is, <coughs> suppose that we know these. We know the solution phi q. Now I have two Q charge, assuming we already know that solution. And now I add another Q charge on my conductor, but in that case the new potential will still satisfy the Laplacian outside my conductor because there are no charges there. Well, I mean, even if you put some charges, it doesn't really make any difference. <coughs> phi should be constant on the surface, plus this normal derivative, which is the electric field, if we integrate the electric field over the surface of the conductor, this is the surface of the conductor, it should be minus 2q over epsilon zero. So what is this function? Let me call this phi 2q. Well, let's try one solution. Let's see if it will, let me try a function, and let's see if it satisfies all these conditions. Uh, let us choose that function to be twice the original function. Does it satisfy this equation? Laplacian acting on this one, this is just a constant, take it out. So this is the Laplacian of this one is nothing but twice the Laplacian of this function, but Laplacian of this function is zero. So it already, this trial function, we are just guessing one solution. This guess satisfies this equation. Is it constant on the surface? Well, if you look at the value of this, this function on the surface, it is twice the value of this function on the surface. But the value of this function on the surface is constant. So the value of this function is constant on the surface. So this is also satisfied. Well, if you take the normal derivative of this one, it is nothing but the twice the normal derivative of this one. And the integral of the normal derivative of this one was nothing but minus q over epsilon 0. So if you multiply it by 2, we get phi 2q. Take the normal derivative, integrate over the surface, and it will be the integral will be minus 2q over epsilon 0. So we already know a function that satisfies all our conditions. But now we know that the solution is unique. So this should be the only solution. So it basically tells us that, let's say, if you double the charge, the total charge of a given system, of a given conductor, let's say, the only thing that changes is the total, everything is multiplied by two. The potential at every point is multiplied by two. The electric field at every point is multiplied by two. But the general shape, the relative uh, values do not change. So that's the, uh, the moral of the story. In particular, let's say, if we have not one conductor, let's say two conductors of arbitrary shape, We put some charge over here, another charge over here. The electric field at this point, or the potential at the same point, the electric field at the point R divided by Q, or phi divided by Q at the same point, the 
these quantities are independent of Q. They don't depend on Q, <coughs> on this total charge. Let's choose the point A and B. V A minus V B divided by Q, which is nothing but phi some point on A, or let's say phi R A minus phi R B divided by Q. Now, phi is independent of, phi over Q is independent of Q, so this is also independent of Q. If you just double the charges, this difference will be doubled, but Q is also doubled, the ratio doesn't change. If you just put three times more charge, the potential difference will become three times more, again, the ratio will not change. So this ratio, Let's say delta V over Q, let's call it 1 over C, depends only on the geometry of the conductors. Their relative distance, relative orientation, etc. So once the conductors are fixed, their geometry is fixed. <clears throat> no matter how much charge you put on them, of course, keeping in mind that here the, the total charge here is exactly the opposite of total charge over here. You shouldn't change that, but as long as you don't change that, if you just double the charge density at every point, so it's just the potential at every point is doubled, the electric field at every point is doubled, so this ratio will be fixed. It will be independent of how much charge you put. Well, if it is not, it doesn't depend on the charge, the only thing it can depend on is the shape, the shapes of how you put the conductors together. And that constant that we defined over here, C, is called the capacitance. Now, question, what does it have to do with the capacity? Now, capacitance, as an English word, it, it comes from capacity. So it kind of measures some kind of a capacity. But what capacity are we talking about here? What does it have to do with capacity? So what does it mean? I mean, you see, when you talk about the capacity of this bag, it tells me how much stuff I can put in this. If I have a conductor, what limits me from adding more and more charge? What kind of a limit is it? How can I relate this to a con I mean, <clears throat> when you say the limit of a charge, what I understand is beyond a given coulombs, let's say one million coulombs, you cannot add an additional charge. What limits me? I mean, in this case, I know that it is the volume that is limiting me. This has a finite volume. If anything takes more volume, I cannot put it inside. I just cannot. So what, what prevents me from putting more charge here? So, I mean, how does the surface area prevent me from putting more charge? This is much below that. Of course, that is another limit. You see, we had already seen that the electric field, if you have an electric field, there is an exerted force on the metals. And that force can eventually break your metal. But this capacity is much below that, that limit. That's another limit. So what happens if we go above let's say, a certain limit. 
for again back to this example of the volume, I can tell you that, okay, so the volume of this bag is such and such. So if an object has a volume larger than that value, I cannot go, I cannot put it in this bag. What about this capacitance? No, if we know the capacitance of an object, what is this limit? Hmm? Yeah. So there's no limit if he's right. So why is, do we talk about capacity? Uh, he's not completely right. What is he missing? Yes, exactly. There is, there is this concept of electrical breakdown. Basically what happens is, that is what happens when you see a lightning. Lightning causes an electrical breakdown of the atmosphere. There's such a huge electric field created there. It breaks the, at the atoms into uh, ions and the electrons. It creates this plasma and plasma becomes conducting. So the <coughs> we have a current that goes from the clouds to the ground and, or the other way around. If you have two metals, yeah, they are, these are not in empty space. And, well, there will be basically two things. We said that, okay, the electrons cannot leave the conductor, but even that force has a certain limit. If you go above that, the electrons will easily leave the conductor and they can just fly off in vacuum, in empty space. Where will they go? Well, this has an excess electron. The electrons can just leave if you exert a sufficiently strong electric field. So it will leave and it will just go to the other one. Or if, if this whole configuration is in a, in a medium, there is still a maximum electric field beyond which the atoms of that medium of the atmosphere will break down. And if they break down, they break into ions and the electrons. That's a conductor, so there will be charges carried across. Now what determines whether this happens or not will be the electric field. If there is a sufficient electric field, sufficiently strong electric field, this phenomena can happen. Now, since the geometry is fixed, a sufficiently large electric field is the same thing as a sufficiently large potential difference. So if you exert a sufficiently large potential difference, then the charges will just go from one conductor to the other one. Now, you see, for a given charge distribution, for a given Q, or let's say for a given delta V, ma maximum possible value of delta V, the larger the capacitance is, the larger the maximum charge that the system can carry. So that is why it is related with capacity. If a, capa if a capacitor, this object, has a large capacitance, it can hold a larger charge before electrical breakdown. Of course, if you replace it with a different material that has a different uh, threshold value for electrical breakdown, of course, the, <coughs> the maximum charge that can be stored will be modified, but for a given system with a given material with a given threshold of electrical breakdown for the electric field, etc., the capacitance directly tells you what is the maximum charge that you can store. Now, by definition, delta V, Q, and C, they are all positive numbers. That's just how we define them. Okay, in your book, it is said that Q is the charge of the positive plate, or positive conductor, but it doesn't really have to be, you don't really need to look at Q as the charge of the positive conductor. You can also say that, okay, so this configuration you can create by putting plus Q over here or minus Q over here, or by just moving, let's say, uh, minus Q from this plate to this plate. So you can say that Q is the amount of charge that you have moved from one region to the other region. It's just a conventionally, they are all defined to be positive numbers. 
Of course, when you are connect this uh, to a circuit, it will make difference which end is positive and which end is negative, but just for definition purposes, keep in mind they are all positive. Well, this kind of also tells us how we can determine the capacitance of an object. Put some charge, plus Q and if you have a system, put plus Q and minus Q on different parts of your system, and they will create an electric field. Given the electric field, calculate the potential difference. Given the potential difference, between the plates divided by the charge that created that potential difference because we know that the potential difference is proportional to the charge. Once we cancel this charge, what remains is independent of the charge and that is what we call the inver one over the capacitance. So that will be the strategy. Let's do an example. Well, the typical example is the parallel plate capacitor. It's sufficiently large, the separation is sufficiently small so that we can ignore the fringing effects. And we will assume that if we have some plus Q on one plate, minus Q on the other plate, approximately at least the electric field will be uniform. And we had already determined that the electric field, if this is the Z axis, was equal to minus sigma over epsilon zero in the z direction. This is our electric field. Now, the pot this is constant. Now, the potential difference we defined as E dot dl across, let's say, point A and point B. This is equal to E times delta L, but this is nothing but sigma over epsilon zero times, let's say the separation is D, D. This is delta V. Okay, I, I am aware that I have ignored the signs several, in several places, but why, for definition purposes, we already know that the delta V should be positive. So that's why I ignore the signs. Well, Q is nothing but the surface charge density times total surf surface area of the plates. S is the surface area of plates. 1 over C was nothing but delta V over Q, this was the definition. So what we did is we put the charges, we calculated the corresponding electric field. Knowing the electric field, we know the potential difference. Knowing the potential difference, <coughs> divide by the total charge, this is nothing but one over C. So this is equal to sigma over epsilon zero times D one over sigma S sigmas cancel, so the capacitance is epsilon zero, S over D. Now this relation between delta V, Q, and C, you can also write it in this form. Especially, uh, at least for the Turkish speaking speakers, with, to remember whether this is Q equal to C times delta V or C, V is equal to Q times C, one easy way that I was taught in high school was this, was, this equation was Q is Jawat. Well, you understand Turkish that much. Anyway, in the exam, you will be given these equations. Okay. 
Let's do another example. And let's just assume we have two concentric uh, cylinders, <coughs> or let, let's do spheres. It will be easier. We have an inner sphere and an outer sphere, a spherical conductor, a spherical capacitor. The inner sphere has radius, let's say, A. The outer sphere has radius B. What is the electric field? Let's say one in region 1, region 2, and region 3. Of course, we put some, let's say, plus Q charge over here, minus Q charge on the inner sphere. So to calculate the potential, the capacitance, we first need to put some plus Q in one, re one side and minus Q on the other side. So we put the charges, plus Q is over here, minus Q is over there. <coughs> now, what is the electric field in region 1? And we are, of course, assuming that the spheres are uniform. So we have this spherical symmetry. It looks the same no matter how much we rotate, how we rotate it around its center. Nothing changes. So what is the electric field in this region? And the charge is uniformly distributed on the surface. So what is the electric field here? Zero, because it's inside both of the spheres, and a uniform sphere does not create an electric field inside. Electric field in region three. The electric field in region three is also zero, because we are out of both of these spheres. And if you are outside the sphere, a sphere, the spherical surface, it just acts as a point charge at the center of that spherical surface. So this outer sphere acts like a point charge of plus Q at the center. The inner sphere just acts like a point charge at the center with minus Q charge. So the total charge of this system is, the system behaves as a system, a point charge right at the center with a total charge of plus Q plus minus Q is zero. So there's no charge, so there's no electric field outside. Now, the electric field in region 2. This region. Well, that's one way, but we already know one result of the Gauss's law. Let's say at this point, we are inside this sphere. So the electric field created by the outer sphere at this point will be zero. We are, no, you see, <coughs> we are in region A, in region two. We are dividing this, the electric field can in principle receive two contributions, the contribution from the outer shell, E from the outer, plus E from the inner. Now, the electric field created by the outer shell is zero, because we are inside this shell, and the spherical shell doesn't create an electric field inside. So E outer is zero. Now we have the E inner, the electric field created by the charges on the inner shell. Well, the we are out of this shell now. Since we are out of this shell, it just behaves like a point charge at the center of charge minus Q, so we know what the electric field of a point charge is. It is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 minus Q over R squared in the radial direction. So this is the net electric field in region 2 between these shells. So we <coughs> the strategy is the same. We put some charges in our system. For these charges, we have evaluated the electric field. Now we know the electric field. We can calculate the potential difference. Delta V would be nothing but the integral of E dot dl. Well, this is nothing but 
DL, <coughs> well, the electric field is in the radial direction, so the only component of DL that we are actually interested in is the radial component. So this is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 minus Q over R squared times dr, r goes from a to b. This is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, q times 1 over b minus 1 over a. The integral of 1 over r squared is minus 1 over r, r changes from a to b. Now, delta V is equal to Q times 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, A minus B over A times B. Well, as we had claimed, the potential difference is proportional to the total charge. So this should be equal to Q over C or C is equal to 4 pi epsilon 0, AB over B minus A. No, Q is not the total charge. Q is the charge that is separated. You see, in a capacitor, when we are talking about the capacitors, we are talking about neutral system. The total charge is always zero. But charge is somehow separated. We have some plus Q charge in one region and minus Q charge on the other region. No objections? Why not? Here we had the A minus B, which suddenly become B minus A. You see, by definition, C is a positive number. And delta V appearing in the definition of C should be a positive number. So that's why I'm putting the absolute value now. B is larger than A. That's why I switched them. B minus A is a positive number. AB is positive anyway. Okay, let's do it in more detail. Electric field on region three. Again, I can just, I mean, the charge distribution I can just imagine as uh, consisting of two parts, the inner sphere and the outer sphere. So each one of these parts will create an electric field. The total ele electric field will be the sum of the electric fields created by each part of the charge distribution. So this I can write as the electric field of the outer shell plus the electric field of the inner shell. Do you agree? Now let's see, what is the at this point, what is the electric field created by the outer shell? This one. We are outside this shell. Outside the shell, it should behave as a point charge at the center. Well, the point charge has a total charge plus Q. So we know the electric field created by a point charge. So E outer will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. This is the overall constant. Q over R squared in the R hat direction. This is E outer. Now let's look at the electric field created by the inner shell at this point at some point in region three. 
Well, again, we are out of that shell. So out of that shell, it, it will still behave as a point charge at the center. And that charge is minus Q at the center. We know the electric field created by a point charge of minus Q, it is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 times minus Q over R squared R hat. And they exactly cancel each other because both the outer shell and the inner shell have the same center. For example, if this shell was slightly shifted and still if the charge was uh, homogeneously uniformly distributed over the surface, then the electric field in region 3 wouldn't be different. Because in that case, this R and this R will be different. This, is, this R is the distance from the uh, center of the outer shell. This R over here is the distance from the center of the inner shell. And since the centers of the outer and the inner, inner shell are, are the same, this R and this R is the same. They are the same R. And since they are the same R, this term and this term exactly cancel each other, so we get zero electric field in the outer region. Okay, as a last thing that we do today, let's calculate the energy stored in a capacitor. Now, this is one capacitor, one conductor in the capacitor. This is another conductor in the capacitor. Yeah, the, con the conductors in capacitor, they don't need to be horizontal, they don't need to be flat, they don't even need to be regular or enclosing each other. Just take any two conductors, that makes a capacitor. Anything that can hold on charge is a capacitor. Even a single conductor basically is a uh, capacitor because if this configuration is a capacitor, it will still be a capacitor no matter where this is, just send it to infinity. So you get a single conductor, which is a capacitor. So we have this system. There we put a plus Q charge over here, a minus Q charge over there. So let's say this conductor is at a potential V1. This conductor is at a potential V2. The energy of this system, you see the energy stored in any charge configuration, we said that we can always evaluate it, at it as 1 over 2 sum over QI VI, VI being the potential at the position of the charge QI. And this sum is over all point charges. But I can separate this sum into two parts. Let's say this is uh, conductor A, this, no, this is con, uh, metal A, this is metal B. This, let me divide it into two, QI, VI, where QI is in metal A, plus 1 over 2, QI, VI, where QI is in metal B. I have any terms in the first sum. I know that all the charges are either in metal A or in metal B. I just divide the, separate them. But once I separate them, the, all the charges in metal A are at the potential V1 because every point on the metal is at the same potential. And furthermore, all the points on metal B, they are also at the same potential because every point on the metal is on the same potential. In this case, it is V2. So this is equal to 1 over 2 QI in metal A of QI times V1 plus 1 over 2 QI times V2 where QI is in metal B. Now V1 is a constant. I can take it out of the sum. What remains is nothing but the total charge of metal A. But the total charge of metal A is nothing but plus Q. 
So this is equal to 1 over 2 plus Q times V1 plus 1 over 2 V2, I can take it out of the summation sign, it is constant. Well, the sum over all the charges in metal 2 just gives me the total charge in metal 2, two but that is minus Q. So the electric energy stored in this capacitor system, no matter what its shape is, is always given by 1 over 2 Q V1 minus V2. But V1 minus V2 is nothing but the difference in the potential energies of the metals. And we know that V1 minus V2 can be written in the form Q over C. So the energy stored in a capacitor is always can be written as 1 over 2 Q squared over C, which is the same thing as 1 over 2 C times delta V squared, whichever one you prefer. Of course, you could have calculated the same energy by just starting with neutral uh, conductors and carrying charges one by one from one side to the other side. And you, when you have a, moved a total charge of Q, this will still be the, the result that you obtain. <laughs> Which one would you like? You can use this expression or this expression. They are the same. You see, the capacitance of this, we don't talk about the capacitance of this metal or this metal. We talk about the capacitance of this system. So if you move this to infinity, you have another, a different system. It has a different capacitance. Well, you are, are you changing the geometry? So you are changing the capacitance. Just wrote, I mean, change one of them. Yes. Are you changing the relative geometry? Yes. So capacitance changes. Well, if you just rotate everything as a whole, as a rigid object, well, the geometry, relative geometries are not changing, so the capacitance does not change. But if you change any one of them, the capacity changes. For example, in your question, what happens if one of them shrinks? Well, we already have a solvable example over here. You can shrink the inner shell, for example. If you shrink the inner shell, that is A goes to zero, capacitance goes to zero. Or if you have a single sphere, you can talk about its uh, capacitance. Well, a single sphere would correspond to this, take this system and take the limit B goes to infinity. As B goes to infinity, the capacitance will be proportional to the radius. So if you bring two spheres, two charged spheres, bring them in contact, since the capacitance of each one is proportional to the area, they will share their charges, not the area, the radius, they will share their charges proportional to their radius. Yes, any last questions? Well, 
de ağrı dağına koyuyorum. Böyle bir kapasite var. Infinite enerji depolar mı? What is the capacitance? Well, if the separation is infinitely large, let's say we have a parallel plate capacitor, almost parallel plate, the capacitance turned out to be d is infinite, the capacitance is zero. So if you can exert a if you exert a finite potential difference, if you exert a finite potential difference, c is zero. So there is no energy store. Well, this other expression looks a bit problematic because as c goes to zero, it seems the energy for a finite q, if c goes to zero, the energy seems to go to infinity. But you see the c goes to zero, a c, uh, c will be go to zero, but this, uh, not this expression, yeah. c goes to zero basically assumes that we have this infinite plates. If you don't have infinite plates, this result will be different. And if you have infinite plates, well, the electric field is uniform. So you have to exert a constant force. You have to exert this constant force over an infinite distance to create a finite potential, uh, finite charge separation. Then you do infinite work and you store infinite amount of energy. But of course, this is not realistic. Okay, so see you tomorrow. Don't forget that we will also have a lecture tomorrow, not just problem solving.